Hi, my name is Sergey, and I'm a solution architect. In this video, I'd like to talk about iPad. I use this tool a lot. As a solution architect, I find it very helpful to use the diagramming capabilities. And also, the pencil is a great kind of input device, although, you know, a bit old fashioned. Anyways, it's also great for meetings because it kind of takes a lot of time usually as an architect to have discussions and meetings and other devices barely provide the same amount of time to be uh, on a call. In this video, I'd like to provide a couple of ideas on how you can use your iPad or any other tablet device as a coding station for you. Um, some of the ways that I'm going to cover are going to be paid, so I'll put all the information about how much it costs at the time of recording, which is what? March 9th, 2021. So, many of the topics I'm going to cover here may be applicable to other tablets or even, or even mobile devices. And since I have iPad, I'll refer to it as a device that I, ca I currently have access to. I've got my iPad 2020 Pro version 12.9 inch. But the same rules and capabilities can be applied to any other iPad device you can get. Before we get started, one last note. Apart from the iPad itself, you also need accessories that will provide you more or less convenient experience. I personally have two setups. Magic Keyboard, um, which is nice, but expensive as hell. And honestly, it's not like my preferred option. I usually come up to this when I have to be on on a way on my way somewhere or if I'm if I know that I'm going to code in an, in a place where I don't have a desk to use so in these cases it's okay but for all the other cases I use another setup so in most cases I use this set setup this is an iPad sleeve that I bought on AliExpress for like $12 it's very then, as you can see, um, it fits the iPad almost perfectly. You can see the issue with the camera. And also I have this uh, keyboard, which is in my case, a mechanical and pro two with brown Gatron switches. So it doesn't have to be mechanical keyboard. It can be any Bluetooth key. key. Uh, you feel it's comfortable, but that's what I currently have and mostly I have these two devices. I don't use my, my mouse very often. So this video states that we're going to have five ways of how to use your iPad as a coding station. Of course, it's not the full, the full list because there are multiple ways and extensions to the ways I provide where you can use other uh, applications or other approaches and they can be mixed together. But not to make this video last forever, I decided to uh, limit the list based on, on criteria. So when you make a top, you should always have a, a top list. When you make a top list, you should probably have a cri criteria on how to pick those. So first, it should be versatile. So you shouldn't be bound to specific language. That's why I didn't take any stuff like Python is to where uh, you can actually write code and execute it in the on the iPad itself, but you are tightly bound to this specific programming language, which is not an option because mostly you don't do that in real life. I mean, it's fine if you do pandas and stuff, but I think it's not supported there. Anyways, another critical option that I thought is critical is ability to execute your code and see if it works. And this is really important in most cases because I don't think there are developers really who write code and it works automatically all the time and they don't make any mistakes and they're not creating a hello world application. And I also uh, filtered out all the items that don't have a steep learning curve because I feel it is important to be able to jump into the development right away without any prerequisites and uh, doing some magical stuff with configuration. With these requirements in place, with this criteria in place, I came up with the following list. So. Our first option is gitpod.io, which is basically VS Code available through a browser. 
it's full featured. It provides a terminal. It provides uh, ability to install extensions and stuff. And if we talk about pricing, it has a free model. It's also not very expensive, but you're limited to the amount of hours per month. If you don't want to have that limitation, you can self-host it, which is also available for free. And since this application is quite easy to use, let's go through the process of creating an account here. So I sign up with my GitHub account. There is also GitLab and Bitbucket available. We accept the terms of service and that's it. We get to the workspaces page where we can choose one of these. I'll show you quickly. So let's pick which one. This one in TypeScript because it's cool. It takes some time to load. Yeah, it's done. As you can see, it's VS Code. But the cool thing about Gitpod is you can put a pound sign and then provide the URL of your GitHub repository. And I'll use mine or lovdev and there I put my website project which is orlov.dev and as you can see yeah this is it this is the readme i have access to the application and the terminal and i can yarn here for example and see the dependencies i have in this project to being installed so that i can use them and make it work as you can see it supports labels for files and code highlighting all the stuff you usually have in VS Code so it's quite convenient in the sense the problem though is that you cannot use scrolling with your mouse in the editor window and your trackpad pad won't work either and if you try to uh, pull the scroll bar it's also going to work in an ugly manner so the way you can bypass this limitation is to use your arrows and to go up and down with it. Let me see. Our dependencies are still installing. Anyways, yeah, we're done. So, as I've said, you can go up and down with like keys, something like that. Not sure if it's something to care of. If you use Vim or something, you should be okay with that. But if that sounds bad to you, I can say that it's a problem for most instances of VS Code in the browser. And since we no longer need these workspaces, we should stop them. And I think that's it. Our next option is glitch.com, which is basically about the same as the previous one, gatebot.io, but it's somewhat limited to the things you can do with it. It supports websites and it also supports Node.js. It's generally kind of cool for those limited scenarios. Um, I promise not to in include something like this, but it's made by the same guys who created Stack Overflow, Trello, and other awesome projects we know and love. And it's also quite fast and really really inexpensive so let's jump into it we sign up they have facebook for some reason but we use github and we quickly get to the uh, first page so let's create a new project yeah it's, it loaded yeah this is it if we take a look at the prices it costs you eight dollars per month if you bill if you're billed annually and ten dollars per month if you pay per month what you get for that is access to private projects if you have them in, on GitHub. It also removes rate limiting and you get 4,000 hours of uptime. So that would be enough to support, I think, five projects full time every month without necessity to um, get them up and running every time you connect. And what you also get is for five projects, you can enable always on support. You can enable extra memory from 512 megabytes to grow to two gigabytes and you get more disk space 
I don't think it's enough if you're a node modules kind of guy, but anyways, it's two times better than it was. So uh, let's try to create a project. Let's start with a Hello Express one. And yeah, we are done. This is a simple application. Uh, we have a terminal here, which we can use to do things with it. But for now, let's go to views and there have there they have in index.html, let's say something like uh, boo. I like setting boo everywhere. Here is the show button that you can click and you can choose where you want to see the result of the application. Let's use a new window. And as you can see, it says boo in the HTML page. So that's it. This is how it works. And you can um, go to your projects and click a new project. And you can import from GitHub where you can provide um, a name of repository, uh, the org name and the name of the repo. And let's go with, uh, let's paste these and started loading I'm not a native speaker I don't know what mode is but I think marshy is from the word marsh uh, that thing near the forest with a lot of water okay anyways not sure about this so as you can see we have the readme we have the files we have everything right here so if we take a look at index.js, it simply exports one simple function. That's it about glitch. And let's move on to the next one. Our next candidate is Wasaterm. It's a terminal application that you can access via your browser. And essentially, you purchase a virtual machine and you can access it uh, from Google Chrome or Safari or whatever. Their prices are very flexible. Here are some examples. And as you can see, they have a calculator, which means they don't provide fixed pricing for what you use. Uh, the price will be different from case to case. So here you can estimate what it's going to be. I'll select Paris because I'm nearby. And here you can see like a million options. I think they put all possible combinations here, starting with one gigabyte RAM and one CPU and ending with, I don't know, over a terabyte of RAM. You can also put storage, which is the amount of gigabytes you will need. And they say that this is uh, dynamic. Uh, so this price you can see here might be different. It might be higher or lower, depending on how you use. Uh, their estimation is based on the fact that you're going to use it for 20 days, eight hours a day, which means they calculate for 160 hours and they suggest that you turn off your machine when you don't use it and that way you will save some money so I think it's now time to try and sign up yeah here you have to fill the forms and then you need to confirm your email subscription and get to the login screen where you can use your credentials and after clicking login you're inside uh, a note here, you will need to provide your credit card number, press this button, choose the amount of credit you want to provide them up front, uh, purchase credit, fill in the data. So after we come to the billing information, we can see a $10 purchased credit and we can go to terminals and create storage. We should provide a name, it shouldn't be something like test because as they say on the right, the name is going to be the subdomain on wasaterm.com. So let's choose something more adequate. I'll go with Orlov Dev. Now we need to choose size. It must be at least three gigabytes. So let's go with three, but it's up to you how much you need. Then we choose region. As I've said, I'm in Paris nearby and the username I will use in the terminal is going to be Orlov Dev as well. So we click create storage and we're done. We can click the run button where we can select the kind of CPU, the amount of CPU cores and the amount of memory we want to have on the machine. And then we run terminal here. 
So now that we are ready, we get to the panel where we can see our terminals that are available for us. And this one is running, this is the public IP, and we can click the open button to get to the terminal itself. So here we are. And the cool thing is that it's a full featured machine where we can write any code, like we can do whatever we want, ls or whatever, and we can vim. So if you're the vim kind of guy, this should definitely meet all your needs because this is a full featured vim, you can do whatever you want with it, and I want to quit now, please. Thank you, vim. And yeah, that's it about this approach with Vazaterm, and I think it should feature if you like Vim. So, next way to do it is to use um, Termius or uh, Blink Shell or any other application. I decided to go with Termius because even though it has um, subscription that you have to pay for, it's not very expensive and it's um, quite easy to use and it provides a lot of uh, powerful capabilities so if you don't like this application you can choose any other other one you like so uh, Termius is fine here you have a free trial by the way for quite some time and you can try it out and cancel subscription at any time so Termius provides us uh, the ability to connect to all any um, existing external machine over SSH or MOSH and to start using it, we need to go to uh, some kind of provider where we can get a VPC, and there we can create an instance that we're going to use. Um, I personally decided to go with uh, DigitalOcean. You can use AWS or whatever you um, find convenient and have experience with, because it's not a big deal. I'm okay with DigitalOcean. I like their pricing, and uh, they're very straightforward in the sense of creating stuff so um, you need to sign up here if you don't have an account and uh, keep in mind that you have to provide your credit card when you create an account with um, uh, DigitalOcean so we go to droplets this is what they call um, their uh, virtual machines and we click create droplet so here I'm okay with the defaults I'm okay with the basic plan and I think I'll use regular Intel with SSD and I'll pick this one is fine I think two gigabytes of RAM one CPU is fine for me uh, here you can choose different um, data center regions I'm okay with Frankfurt because it's the closest to me by the way you can add block storage um, which means you can increase the amount of space for your machine because by default we're going to have 50 gigabytes and two terabytes transfer. So what we do next is I don't need any of these and I don't need SSH. I'll go with a password, which means I will create a root password and I'll go with something ridiculously dumb. I'll make something like, um, let it be one, two, three, four, password. Um, never mind. I'll delete this droplet in a moment. So, uh, we can choose the amount of droplets we want to create and hit one. And we can also choose a host name. I'm okay with or love or love dev test. I think it's fine. You can add tags and then you can apply different rules to those tags. I don't need it right now. And you can also enable, enable backups, which will cost you 20% of the droplet price. Um, this will happen once a week so if you want to retain copies of what you had a week before um, you can enable backups so now we click create droplet it's quite fast it's going to take you a moment okay and here is the ip address public ip address so we can click the copy button and that's all we need from uh, DigitalOcean, we can go to Termius, we can create a new host, I'll say alias, it's just for a readable name for you, I'll say DigitalOcean Orlov Dev Test, host is going to be the IP address, and I'm going to use SSH, the port is default, uh, the username is going to be root, and the passport is going to be my super secret passport, one, two, three, four password um, that's it 
I definitely not recommend going with this approach and creating a root password and stuff. I suggest you to go with SSH, but it's fine for me right now just for the sake of showing you how it works. I'll use a different um, appearance. I think Tremors Dark is fine. And I click save and that's it. Now if I click this, it says blah blah blah. We say continue. It's authenticating. Yeah. And we got to the machine. We can ls. And as you can see, we're in all of dev test, which was the name of our machine. It has a snap and we can go one level up and see what's in here. Yeah, we have all the stuff. Since this is a full featured Linux machine, you can do whatever you want with that. And you can even share your code with other developers if you put it um, available for external access and this machine will be available to you. Again, if after you can complete working with it, you can exit and um, with DigitalOcean, there is no viable way to stop the instance because if you stop it, it will still mean that it's going to be um, paid for. So there is no big deal in making this. But if you feel like you no longer need a specific machine for a specific code base, you can simply uh, hit the three button, uh, three dots, and I think it's a kebab. It's called kebab. I don't know. Uh, and hit destroy. It's going to destroy your droplet, and that's it. I reserved the best thing for the end of the video, so uh, we're back again in the DigitalOcean uh, dashboard panel. I created an uh, instance, a droplet, uh, which is a bit larger than the previous one. Um, I would definitely recommend to go in with as much capabilities as you need, depending on what kind of code you write. And when I copy this, I paste it in the browser and I get to this page. So here we are and as you can see this is VS Code and it switched the domain it's served under HTTPS and it kind of works. You can create files, you can open folders. As you can see, I have the default o folder open. If you click open, uh, it will provide this home coder and this is the user. So um, we have this user's default uh, home directory. Uh, we can create uh, a new directory here. Uh, let's call it my app and we can open my app click enter and this page updates and you get to this folder it opens a new instance where you're in the my app and you can create a file let's say let it be index.html for example here we are and we have all the stuff that we usually have with VS Code um, emit tabs default syntax we can go lorem and copy paste it many times we can go to settings we can open it and change whatever we want so the font size should be I don't know 20 why not save it yeah it's much bigger um, let's get back to 13 I prefer 13 and what I want to do also can shout command shift P and I go with theme, color theme. I can change it. Uh, the only difference is that it doesn't apply it that quickly, but we can go with Monokai. We can install additional themes and these opens the browser. We can install the icons. Okay, so we can go, we can command shift P. We can open preferences choose a color theme we can apply uh, which one let it be dark um, it kind of nice it's not the same dark I think as it is oh it kind of applied the styles it's a bit laggy because it's working online and I have a very limited machine but um, let's go with the dark theme and it works so the only quirk here is that you cannot use your 
uh, touch pad, but the magical thing about your body is that you have fingers and iPad was specifically made for this kind of input device. So you can use your finger to go around the, the text and it will work in the editor perfectly. So with this in place, you can write any code you like and uh, to make it work, you will need a VPC and to make it work, you simply need to go to uh, github.com slash cdr slash deploy code server as it is stated here we don't need all this additional information because we need to get to the direct link as you can see cdr slash deploy code server and here we go down a bit and we open DigitalOcean and click see the guide and what we need to do here is we need to create a new droplet with Di DigitalOcean by the way, there are other options available. If you don't want to use DigitalOcean, you can pick one of these. For example, Heroku is quite popular. So they ask to create a 2004 uh, instance. Hey, open it. Yeah. They suggest 2010, not 2004, but 2010. Let's use 2010. Uh, they don't care about the size, but let's pick uh, I don't know. I think from what they suggest, it should be two gigabytes and one CPU, but I think four gigabytes with two CPUs is more uh, of an option. Then we go down a bit. We select the uh, data center region. Uh, for me, again, uh, Frankfurt is closer, but I need to use regular, C uh, regular, regular SSD. So I pick this one, I pick Frankfurt and it's just a VPC network, I don't really care. And what we need to do is we need to click here in the user data uh, checkbox, and then we need to open this. Okay, Hub, please show me the page. Yeah, we need to go to DigitalOcean, and here we need to uh, open this link, which says launch code server sh. Uh, click raw, command A, copy, paste it here and that's it. You can go with it an SSH key if you have one, you can go with a password um, as we did in the previous section, create one droplet, give it a name, add tags if you wish to, enable backups, whatever you need to do. Um, you should probably have configu uh, configuration for uh, how you can access your uh, VS code because as you can see anyone can access it on this URL. So you can and enable authentication or if you have a static IP that you're going to use you can go with um, firewall settings with tags it's up to you so you click the droplet and then when it is created like I have in this example with this droplet I already have set up uh, you simply copy the public address you go to it in the browser and it will automatically redirect you to the application and you will be able to start coding with VS Code in the browser. Of course, it works with any device. You can use it in the desktop or wherever you like and you have full access to uh, the machine. You can use the terminal if you wish to. So um, it works 100%. So it's totally up to you how you, can, how you are going to use it. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, so this was the list. Uh, if you know any other examples, you can leave a comment below. Yeah, before we move on, I'd like to make sure that we're on the same page. So um, there is a button below. Uh, it's red and it has some text in it. So please click it. I think it should help. And if you happen to like this video, also uh, choose the emoji that feels like what you feel about this video. So a few hints, I wanted to provide about uh, using your iPad as a coding station. So number one, please disable T9 because it's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, it's going to apply redundant changes to a code, which are going to bring you to insanity because, you know, most of this stuff you type is not real English. Point number two, I would strongly recommend to avoid relying on the mouse. It won't be convenient to use mostly. In, on the iPad because it's not very precise. Okay, and uh, point number three, if you are addicted to having two monitors, I have bad news for you because you will have a mirroring screen with iPad if you, you enable it with a hub. 
and that means that you cannot put things onto screens. But what I want to mention is iPad has great multitasking capabilities where you can swipe around different additional screens. So it kind of fixes the problem most of the time. And if you absolutely need a second screen, then you should probably check another option or maybe Android devices support that. I can I don't know here. I'm not sure about what Android devices can or cannot do. Okay, so in the end of this video, I'd like to um, make a summary if it's usable or not, if iPad is capable of writing code on it. Um, first, technically, no. In most cases, you don't write code on the iPad. You write code somewhere else, and you just have access to it, mostly over HTTP. So it's not really true. But as an intermediary device that you can use to kind of write code, but still be on the go and don't require too much uh, resources from the device and not to listen to those fans spinning when you compile. So if that's what you need, that's fine. Another thing, so is that convenient? Mostly, yes, you can write code, especially if you use Vim, that's just the perfect scenario. If you like Vim, I, I definitely recommend going with an iPad if you have one, because it's going to be so cool. Anyways, uh, the thing I also wanted to point out that uh, for now, there is no real way to make it work as if it was a real desktop device. And I don't think there, there will ever be. If you like experimenting, if you think like you are okay with all the limitations that I've covered, then you can try one of these approaches. And once again, if you want to hear more about how to do that, I can create in-depth tutorials. Uh, please let me know in the comments. Please click all the buttons you can see. Okay. I think we're done with it. Um, we every Wednesday new videos, stuff, blah blah blah. Okay, bye guys.